Cheryl Young, Rockefeller Global Family Office private advisor, is here to talk about all of that. Cheryl, great to see you. Great to see you, Michael. How are you thinking about the scenarios in terms of what the Fed does, what the market expects, how we should react, and what it says about the economic environment here? Yeah, you know, Michael, the markets are pricing in a 50 basis point cut tomorrow. I mostly. Think it's, <laughs> it's, mostly. It's almost a coin flip. But well, yeah. we're, seeing it, we're yeah. seeing it fade right now, yeah. and, and I think that's partly why. I, I'm expecting 25 basis points. Look, I'm a data girl. I'm from Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. The data just does not support 50. Um, so I think we'll see 25 tomorrow. But look, I'm also a long-term investor, and I really care more about the trend than what happens in one day. So if you're a gambler, you care about what happens tomorrow. If you're an investor, you care about what happens over the next year. Yeah. You call them speculators, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> there are plenty of them out there watching. But I, you, know, you say you're, you're focused on the data. What particular data says 50 would be out of bounds? I ask because it seems like a lot of the reports and the chatter and the commentary in the last few days has been directed at building a case for why the decline in inflation to current levels and just how high rates are compared to that really do allow for more room to, to ease up front with a 50 basis point cut rather than waiting and going small. Yeah, you know, you can make the argument that they should have cut in July. And I think that's part of the pressure on the yeah. feds tomorrow is, is they really should have cut in July. Um, but look, stock market touched all time high today. Unemployment is still at really reasonable levels compared to long term, although the velocity of the last year is why people are considering the 50 basis point cut tomorrow. So you have to weigh all the data. GDP is still very strong. We still don't see recession ahead of us. But things are softening. And um, I expect GDP to still be, you know, one and a half to 1.7 next year. So we're not seeing that decline go negative. And unless we see recession territory, we just don't want to get really too far away from controlling inflation either, which is the balance act. We still have to keep that inflation in check. I mean, that would net out to a pretty positive view on the economic backdrop, right? I mean, if you really think that there's time and there's, and you know, if we cut by 50 basis points, you're still above four and three quarters percent. So it's not as if you're all of a sudden stimulative. I, I guess the question is, are the stakes particularly high with the decision tomorrow? Or do you feel like we're in a decent place either way or we're vulnerable either way? I, I don't think we're vulnerable. I think we're in a decent place either way. I think I think either choice is going to be a good choice. Now, th there's probably no chance of a no cut. That sure. would be that would be the disastrous scenario where the markets would really react big. You know, 50 basis points does, you know, potentially put some question mark at what data are they seeing that we're not seeing? Are there more signs of, of bad news ahead? And I think that's the reason we will get a 25 basis point cut. But look, either one in the long run is not going to move the needle that much. And we expect five rate cuts over the next 12 months. So yeah. whether they do you know, two and one tomorrow or stretch it out, e either way, I think we're going to get to the same effect over the next year. And of course, there's going to be plenty of guidance and the Fed's formal outlook to, to chew on after the fact to get a sense of what they envision in terms of their pace. Retail sales this morning were OK. I guess we're you okay. would just say no incremental reason to be further worried about the consumer, even if it wasn't a gangbusters number. Um, in terms of the market, you've had this phase where kind of more defensive groups, rate sensitive areas of the market have outperformed. And now you're finally getting some of the consumer cyclicals catching up. But the rule has been the winners of the first half of the year have not done a whole lot since mid-July, right? The mega cap growth stocks, the semis. Um, I think you were concerned to some degree about the concentration of the market in the first half. Where does that leave you now? Yeah, you know, when I was last on with Scott in June, I, I was really concerned about the price, especially of semiconductors. Um, that sector has had a 25% sell-off twice, August 5th to August 7th, and again around September 6th, and, and has bounced back off those lows considerably. Um, however, Semis tend to lead, and you really have to pay attention to how they're moving. So that double bounce off the bottom has me a little bit concerned. Mm -hmm. Valuations were really high. If you look at valuations on the tech sector, it's almost double that of the rest of the S&P 500. And so we really want to see this broadening that we've seen kind of come into play since July continue for a healthy market. When you have 63% of the, of the returns come from seven stocks, yeah. and it was 61% last year, so this is not news. This has been going on for a long time. There's just a lot of concern about how healthy the economy is. Over half of the market, if I look at the S&P 500, is still 48%, so I'm rounding, still negative year to date as of right now. And so that's just not the healthy market we want to see. We want to see that broadening continue. We want to see some of these beat up sectors continue. But my concern also is 
if I look at utilities, just for example, that's a more defensive play, and we've had a huge rally there. There's some names that are at P ratios that look like tech P ratios that really doesn't fit with what sure. utilities should be trading at.